Welcome. It always says that. We're on the Hasidic approach to joy. We're looking at chapter seven. And and I particularly like this chapter because um, I'm kind of, a, uh, I like to be rather practical. And so it's one thing to have philosophical ideas of, of you should, you should, you should, right? But tell me how. And that's what I like about this chapter is it actually tells me how. This is how we do this, right? So, chapter seven, we're going to focus on mind control, right? So, our goal here has been tamid besimcha. Tamid besimcha is that uh, that phrase to always be happy. That's the goal. Is that whatever we're doing, we should be able to be tamid besimcha, constantly happy. If everything is coming from God, everything God does is good. So, obviously, we have to be happy at all times, right? So. When we talk about the the reasons not to be besimcha, not to be happy, it comes down to um, two causes for those those feelings that are the opposite of, of happiness of simcha, right? One is the a painful event, and the other one is the cognizance of it. You know, there there. You always think of the story of the, the guy whose who's business burnt to the ground, but he doesn't know about it, so it doesn't bother him. Right? So, say la vie, right? So, the cognizance of the event and the event itself, both of those are, are critical to the, the causing of the, of the negative feelings, right? So, when I was becoming religious and the phone would ring on Shabbos, and I'm like... How, how do you not answer the phone? You have to answer the phone. Yeah, yeah, right? It could be an emergency, right? So one of the rabbis told me, he said, good will, good news will wait and bad news won't go away. Yep. That's it. Let it go. We can drive ourselves nuts, right? But when I think of Stephen Covey's ha Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and the four quadrants of response, is it urgent or is it not urgent? Is it important? Is it not important? Well, until I answer the phone, I don't know if it's important or not. It may be urgent because it's ringing, but it could be a bill collector for goodness sake. <laughs> or a salesman. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what caller ID is for? Ah. Oh. Now we have caller ID. Come on. And if you have a smartphone, it automatically scans all of these things and nobody comes through who is not in my book or is important. Yeah. There I you love go. It. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. So the idea then is that our mind, we have the control to decide how urgent, how important. Is this something I need to be thinking about and be aware of or concerned of? Or can I choose not to? And a beautiful example that the chapter gives in this one is the Moditzer Rebbe. The Moditzer Rebbe was a Bandagunim. He was a um, a master at, at, at creating prayerful tunes, melodies. And, and he would get deeply into them. And, and they were just beautiful pieces there. Now, he had to have a surgery. This is obviously, you know, 150 years ago. So it was not uh, a modern medical facility. <laughs> and uh, and he wasn't healthy enough to actually go under whatever type of anesthesia they had at that time, which, I, you know, I don't know what that even was at that point, right? But he told them, I will, I will go into meditation to create a nigun. I will go deeply into a nigun, a melody, creating a, a new melody. And when you see that I'm deeply into concentration, then just do the surgery. And he was able to be so deeply concentrated on the nigunim that they were able to do the surgery without any anesthesia whatsoever. Now, it turned out to be 36 stands the nigun. <laughs> 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 but, but did, surgery. <laughs> right um, but the, but the point of the story is is that we have the choice 
to 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 decide how cognizant of uh, a problem we w- we want to be and how much we want to think and, and delve into it. You know, th- th- that becomes our choice. Uh, I think I've told the story before, but one of my boys was late, as usual, and we were going off somewhere for his benefit because he <laughs> wanted to go. And I'm sitting in the car waiting, twiddling my thumbs. Now, in our day of, of cell phones, um, I used the time to call my mom. And I was talking to my mom. And when he finally got in the car, you know, like 20 minutes late or something, finally he gets in the car and we drive off. And I'm still talking to my mother. And about 15 minutes later, I hung up from my mother. And then there was silence in the car. And he said, I am so glad you were talking to your mother. <laughs> and I said, really, why? He said, because you were always happy when you and your mom talk. You always both laugh and giggle and have a good time when you're talking. And if you hadn't been on the phone with her, I would be in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Smart kid. <laughs> but but it's funny because we have that choice, right? It happens to be that my mother and I are very close and we do, we actually, yes, we have a good time whenever we're together or on the phone. We, we, we chat and we talk and we have a good time and and uh, and and life could be tough, and yet when the two of us get on the phone, eh, <laughs> not so tough, right? So again, that's the idea of of how much we want to be thinking and focusing on the painful events. The more we think about them, the more we refresh those painful thoughts and painful events the more magnified and reinforced they become because we're thinking about it. So the the brain has these, I'm going to say like channels. And if you keep redigging the channels, they'll stay fresh. But if you let them go, then slowly they fade and they don't have the same urgency or pain as they used to. But aren't there certain uh, events that are painful or sad that have to be dealt with and and not put into perspective of, oh, this is good? Right. So when we talk about, for example, mourning, mourning has its time. There's the, the category of leaf neames, before the dead, when someone has passed away and they're not yet buried, that time period, you're actually exempt from all of the mitzvahs. You don't have to say Shema. You don't have to put on tefillin. You're exempt from all the positive mitzvahs because the, your dead is before you. Then there's after the funeral, there's the Shiva period, the seven days of mourning. And even within the morning, the first three days, Only close family and relatives and and close friends would come and visit. The other four days, community is welcome to come and visit as well. But there's a a set time. At the end of seven days, someone comes and says, it's time to get up. It's time to get out. And you can no longer stay in, in, in mourning. You have to get on. And then there's also the 30 day period when we still have this level of mourning where you, you don't get haircuts and, and um, you know all these other pieces, um, and it even extends out to the you know the first eleven months. You don't go to weddings and celebrations and things for the first eleven months. Then there's the yard site, the anniversary. So there's a period of mourning when we have to acknowledge our loss and think about that, right? But there's also a limitation to how long one can do that. Torah has a prescribed limit to yes, you have to mourn. So the same thing. You know, with tragic events of any kind, you know, the, we have to mourn our loss. We have to acknowledge that one, but we can't get completely absorbed from it. That that uh, that we can't you know go on with life. We have to be very po- proactive to continue going on with with what we're here for. To put it into military, right? To put it into military terms, when there's a conflict, you have to deal with a conflict. But don't lose the war for the battle. 
you have to be able to cut your losses and move on because there's a much bigger picture involved here. So yes, we have to be able to face our, our, our pains and our suffering and our tragedies, but we also have to be able to move on from, from them as well. And the more we focus on them, think of them and dwell in them, then the stronger they can, they maintain a hold of us. And you've heard me tell this, you know, share these books a, a dozen times, but Dr. Edith Ager, she rock, talks about the choice. Um, in Viktor Frankl's book called Man's Search for Meaning, he talks about between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So we can get wrapped up in the stimulus and become like Pavlov's dogs reacting every time to the same triggers. Or we can make a choice not to be controlled by that. So how do you do that? How do you make a conscious choice to not react to every trigger every time? And so that's where we go to Hasidus, where the Alter Rebbe in the Book of Tainus talks about pushing it away with two hands. To push away an idea with two hands. So what does that, that mean to push away with two hands? We use the example of the nudnik that comes to the door. Now you know this nudnik. <laughs> this nudnik is going to come in and he's going to sit down and he's going to, Yiddish is the best word, to, to, the best terms to be able to talk about this, right? Yep. And nudnik is going to come in and he's going to drain the cup. <laughs> so a, a, a drag, drag a cup means he's going to drag your head. That's a little translation, right? <laughs> <laughs> or he's going to hack and shine it, which is to knock the tea kettle. <laughs> Just make a noise, right? But the, the, if you invite the nudnik in and you entertain him, he will cause you agmas nefesh, pouring out of the soul, ripping out of the soul. And after he leaves, you know he'll come back again. <laughs> he got attention. He will come back. Right? That's option one. Option two is when a nudnik comes to the door, you can go to the door, you can open up the door and stand in his face and scream at him, you are such a nudnik. Go away. Leave me alone. Get out of my life. Get back. But you gave... You gave him attention, negative attention. But for one who is craving any kind of attention, even negative attention is an acknowledgement. Yep. In the Chumash, we talk about the Veda Baal Pe'er. Baal Pe'er was one of the uh, idol worships that the Torah talks about in the times that we were coming uh, into Canaan, taking over the, the seven Canaani nations. They were in different forms of idol worship. And one of the idol worships was Baal Pa'er. How did one serve Baal Pa'er? You went over to it, you turned your back, you lowered your pants, and you take care of your business. And that was how one acknowledges the idol of Baal Pa'er. That was its idol worship. Now, obviously, from where we stand, that's insane. That is just ludicrous, right? But if we put the idea into, into more modern, modern terminology, right? I just have to use the language here. It's crap on me, but at least acknowledge me. There, there is a, a level of you can give me all the negative attention and everything else, but at least acknowledge my existence. It's a desperate plea for acknowledgement. And it's a very sad level, yeah. right? But that was the Aveda of Baal Pe'er. The, 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 the worship of that idol was that that was literally how it was done. So when, when, the, when the nudnik comes to the door and we yell and scream at him, 
and tell him off. The bottom line is he's still getting attention and he will be back. The other option would be don't even answer the door. Just don't answer the door. Now, I don't know how many times you had a nudnik at the door. <laughs> but they don't give up easy. They knock and they knock and they knock. Remember the old Dennis the Menace cartoon? Come on, Mr. Wilson. I can hear you being inside being quiet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So the nudnik is 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 there and he's not going to, it's hard to ignore. It, it's really hard to ignore. So when we talk about pushing over with two hands, it's not enough just to ignore. You also have to turn your attention to something completely different. Engage yourself in something that will distract you from the nudnik at the door and keep you occupied over there and not getting frustrated about the nudnik at the door, even though he's knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. Okay, it's time for a fun story, ready? The nudnik on the door reminds me of a story from when I was in college. I was uh, in a dorm at San Diego State University and I had my little dorm room, right? And I had my desk and my little potted plant with my little water pitcher to water my little plant. And someone came and knocked at the door. So I got up and answered the door and no one was there. So I went back to my study. Someone knocked on the door. I got up and I walked over and answered the door. No one's there. Third time I ignored it. But that didn't go away for long. So by the fourth and fifth time, I took the pitcher of water from my plant and I went to the door and I waited. And when the knocking came, I opened it, threw the water in his face. <laughs> this began a wonderful water fight <laughs> in the dormitory. <laughs> they were brilliant. They were brilliant. And they, they took a, a, a TV tray from the dining hall and they put it at an angle next to the, the crack underneath my door. And they poured pitchers of water. And of course, then went under the door and started flooding my room. <laughs> and then, and then they took a large manila envelope and they filled it with shaving cream. And they slipped the open lid under the door and then. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Added soap to the water flood. Yeah, done before. So, yeah. So, you know, I'm in my room. What you gonna do? So I took my scuba tank and I put the backpack on in my front instead of my back. And I went to the door. And next time the knocking came, I opened the door and opened up 35,000 pressure pounds of pressure per square inch. <laughs> three guys dove for cover <laughs> as they dove into their room one of the guys was slamming the door on the other one <laughs> it was beautiful <laughs> anyway <laughs> that was a class a distraction <laughs> back then as as it is now <laughs> did that stop it <laughs> Um, yeah, it did. It did effectively stop it because <laughs> now, now they were all wounded for having tried to die for cover. <laughs> anyway, so when the nudnik is knocking on the door, you can answer it and give it attention. You can answer it and give it negative attention, but it'll come back. The only way to get rid of it is to ignore it. That's hard. And you have to distract yourself with some other engagement to be able to really effectively ignore it. Um, but And that's hard. That's not easy, right? And, and even then, he'll be back. But if you continue to ignore it time and again and again 
without any response, it will eventually go away. You know what my mama used to said, you know, if you if you ignore them, they'll go away. She was talking about not brushing my teeth. If I ignore my teeth, they will go away. <laughs> anyway. You know, but it's true. Our class here is about most everything happens because it's God's plan. Isn't it yeah. God's plan that he's there to talk to you? He's there to knock. Who says you have to answer? Now, if it's someone who needs help, then, yeah, you, you want to answer because you want to help. But I'm thinking back to years ago when I was doing some counseling. And there was someone who was coming for free counseling and sharing all of their woes. And I thought that my time was was helpful. Until I found out that there were five other people in the community that this person was doing the same thing with. <laughs> well, Kevin, you don't need me. And so I ceased to be one of those sources. I made a conscientious choice. The person has other resources. I don't have to be the one that answers their knocking on the door every time. I don't need to be wasting my time. I don't need to be... Um, I don't need to hear the, the stuff that they're talking about either. It wasn't pleasant stuff. I don't need to be exposed to that. Right? So if I'm the only person that can be there for them, that's one thing. But if there are others who are already being exposed, if there are other resources I can send them to that might actually be more effective, then I don't need to be answering the door. So I can redirect, and then I can stop answering. One of the, the great blessings that we have in being human is that we can't really focus on two things at the same time. And that's a great blessing. That's not what my father said to me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did he say? He said, you can do something. You can do multiple things at the same time. You have the ability to do that. Quit loafing. <laughs> okay. So multitasking has been proven to be ineffective. Really? That's yeah. That's tracking. <laughs> it's it's uh it's very interesting, but so things that that don't take any intelligence. Those you can do multiple things simultaneously. You know, I I try to fold laundry when I'm on the phone with somebody for some, doing something else because it's mindless work. You know, sweeping or doing dishes, all of those are things that are mindless work. And that, that you can multitask in. But when you're actually engaged in something, when you're thinking, if you're seriously listening to someone, it's hard to multitask if you're seriously there, if you're fully present, right? Because you can't really think about two things simultaneously. Things we've done multiple times before are repetitive. In fact, sometimes you get someone who answers your question with the same answer, and you can tell they're not thinking because okay. they're just giving programmed answers. <laughs> just programmed answers, right? They're not really with you, right? So... Because we can only think of one thing at a time, we can choose not to entertain the thought that comes to mind, the negative thought that comes to mind, or the depressing thought that comes to mind, the distressing thought that comes to mind. We can choose to say, okay, I, I hear it, I see it, recognize it, and I am not going to give it time today. I'm closing that door, and I'm focusing on something else completely separate. And I can't think of two things simultaneously. I'm going to engage in something where my mind goes there. And with, with time, with practice, we can actually get very good at this. And well, we that's can make like the rabbi who went uh, to, had surgery 
he focused on on his song. Right. Very interesting. Right. Focus around your little story here. Exactly. Focus deeply on the song, and and then he's he's conscious of that to the exclusion of all else. Blocking out pain is really difficult to do. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. Um, but the thing that is, machshavah shalit alalev, mind controls the heart. Emotions begin with a cognition, a cognition, and we can make a choice about that. We can make a choice to how much we want to get involved in those thoughts, but the emotions are controlled by the heart. So we can act, make a conscientious choice. The mind controls over the heart. To the degree, right? The Talmud talks about idol worship, that anger is idolatry. Anger is idolatry. How is anger idolatry? If a person is angry, they are essentially saying that either God doesn't run the world, or God doesn't do only good, or this isn't from God. It's one of the three. Because if, if it comes from God and God only does good, then this is good. So what am I angry about? So if I'm angry, I must be denying something here. And so that's why anger is considered a void desire. Now, let's clarify here that there are times when one has to be angry for a purpose. Moses threw down the tablets because he had to initiate a teshuva, a repentance from the Jewish people. It was a tool that he used, but he was cognizant of the tool. It wasn't that he lost control of his emotions, but rather that he used anger as a tool to stimulate the teshuva. And bosses have to do that. Drill sergeants do have to do that. You know, parents have to do that. There are times when we have to do that. But if we get wrapped up into that, not as a tool for an end, but we just get wrapped up, then our emotions took control, our mind lost control, then, then that's compared to a void desire. That's compared to, to an idol worship. David, you're muted. Can't that be phrased differently because we're, we're told to take the eight Sahara and make it do good. So ah. can't, can't you, instead of saying anger, saying bad, something that's bad, and turn it around to do something good. Mm -hmm. So let's let's go back to the emotions for a second. Not evil or bad as much as the emotions, right? We're talking about the emotions. Emotions are very powerful. They're very strong motivators. So we talk about, and we're going to talk about this in a later chapter, but one of the things we talk about is the difference between Atzlus and Marirus. Atzvus is bitterness. Uh, Atzvus is 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 is, is um, depression, and Marirus is bitterness. If the emotion is bitter, then it's a catalyst for change. If we're angry about a situation, then we want to do something about it, and it's a catalyst for change. Then we're using that emotion very effectively. How do you know the difference? Marirus, bitterness, is, is a, a push to do something about it. Atzvus, depression, is, is lethargy. It takes energy out of you. So how do you know which way it's going? If you're being productive. You know, if the, if the anger is productive, then 
then something's coming out of it. Uh, but it, but if it's not, we have to know that that's that's going the wrong way. So we look at the the powerful use of emotion to move us forward in good directions effectively, but we have to be very careful that we're actually using it the right way because it can easily be used the wrong way. So again, the idea of machshav shalat al halev, the mind controls the heart. We have to be making a conscientious choice of how to use the emotions that we have effectively and when to lock them out, when to ignore them. I have a, a dear friend of mine who was a chaplain serving at what was a horrific plane accident, and there were hundreds of bodies, oh. and the local mortuaries refused to get involved. And so it literally came down to a few people in federal positions who ended up having to spend weeks at this job. And, and he was telling me that in the time he was there, because he was doing this job for two weeks straight, in the time that he was there, he mentally acknowledged this is overwhelming. This is extremely stressful. We are going to debrief this, but not now. We do not have time now. We'll talk about it later. So there was a mental conversation he had with himself that this is hard, overwhelming, stressful, and I'm going to deposit this for now, and we'll bring it out later. We will. We will talk about it. We will get there. We will debrief this in the right environment, but right now the work has to get done. The mind has to control the heart. It's a conscientious cho choice. And if we if we discipline ourselves, if we train ourselves to choose to think positively, choose to not become angry, the more we practice this, the more we train ourselves to do this, the more it becomes an automatic response. Having worked in emergency services, first responders for eight years, it's one of the things we talk about. You'll be in a stressful environment. And when that scenario is over, we're back to the garage and we're going to debrief. We're going to talk about it. And part of that conversation is lessons we can learn, what went right, what didn't go right, what we could have done better. Part of it is also to, to de-stress by sharing the load, right, with people we know that we can talk to about it. And then another part of that is to normalize our feelings, which oftentimes, guys, you've been, you know, in the military or emergency services, you know full well, we have a really dark sense of humor. Mm -hmm. But that dark sense of humor is a is a skill used to break the control of the emotions. If you can laugh at something so bad and painful, then you've broken the control of it. We have to be careful, especially in the company we keep, because not everybody gets it, right? So we have to be very careful with that. But at the same time, if we're aware of that's what that is, I mean, I've, I've come in as a chaplain sometimes to some situations where um. Yeah, there's some pretty colorful language going on, <laughs> and somebody will notice the chaplains there. And go, sorry, chap. <laughs> and and I'll just smile and nod. Been there, <laughs> seen that. <laughs> sometimes I'll say, sometimes I say, I have a son that's a marine. You haven't cut it for anything yet. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> oh, let me tell you. <laughs> but again, the mind can control the heart. 
It takes practice. It takes discipline. And we shouldn't be surprised because everything in life takes, takes, takes discipline. Our speech, what we should say, what we shouldn't say, when we can talk, when we can't talk, when we can and we can't, you know, the actions that we have, when something's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, life is all about the discipline. So why should we think it's only relegated to, 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 to speech and action? No, it, it's thought, speech, and action. We have to control our thoughts, speech, and action. I think one of the harder ones, um, one of the hardest ones is jealousy. When jealous thoughts come to mind, we don't often recognize it for what it is. And so that can be a tougher one. But recognizing jealousy and being able to say, okay, wait a second. That's jealousy. That's ugly. And I actually don't want to have a part of that. So I'm not going there. I'm not, I'm choosing not to go there. You know, so it has to be a conscientious choice. Uh, I remember uh, being in, in a small congregation uh, for a couple of years and and after services, when the guys were sitting around having coffee and cake and just shooting the breeze, right? There was this tendency to um, make discounting jokes, you know, along the line of, you know, your mother wears army boots. <laughs> but, but, but they were they were really cutting, all said in good humor amongst good friends. But it kind of bothered me. And and so I, I stopped participating. And then some other new boots. <laughs> <laughs> there was some pretty sharp remarks going flying around. And I remember making a conscientious choice to stop myself. And then a week or two later actually spent mentioning to the rabbi also that you know what? This just doesn't feel appropriate, and it's certainly not in a shul uh, amongst people who are trying to improve themselves. And Baruch Hashem, you know, it was it came from the heart, it reached the heart, and slowly but surely it stopped. Uh, but it begins with awareness of the thought being either productive or unproductive, helpful or not helpful, something we want to engage in or not. My dad's comment about foul language was, uh, he was an engineer, he's a chemical engineer, and, and his comment was that in, in a, an important stress environment, you don't, you don't, there's no room for that. In other words, in a command environment, when lives are at stake, the language is dumped because it's not relevant, it's not important, and it doesn't save lives. So then why should we at other times? So it becomes a conscientious choice, but but it takes training. It, it takes it takes conscientious effort and training and and a practice and practice and practice. I, I found for myself, it meant also forgiving myself when I slip. And acknowledging that was stupid and, you know, maybe acknowledging it to somebody else or maybe just to myself, but that's not who I want to be. That's not how I want to behave. Uh, that's not where I want my mind to go. And make a conscientious choice to focus on positive things, on good things, on holy things, and conscientiously choose to control my thoughts towards positive end. You know, there's a, a, a we did a book series for a while on positivity bias. Jeff and I were on that one. We did that a whole discussion for a while on, on the book. book. What? That was an excellent book. Excellent book, positivity bias, and the whole focus of the book is stories of the Lubavitcher Rebbe finding 
difficult, challenging situations and bringing the positive out of it, the good out of it. Finding the good, choosing to see the positive. One of the stories that comes to mind right immediately was there was a Hachnasa Sefer Torah. There was a, a Torah being completed. And let's say the, you know, just say the Jones family is having their, uh, they're celebrating a completion of a Sefer Torah. They're, they've sponsored the writing of the Torah. They're doing their last le letters at their home with guests and family and from the community all coming to participate and celebrate. And then together they would march with the Torah together, singing like Simcha Torah and celebrate it. And, the, and they go to the synagogue. The other Torahs would come out from the synagogue and they would be dancing for a while. And that would be the way we bring in a whole new Sefer Torah to the, to the congregation. And it was a very special and festive event. One of the community members at the event had a heart attack and died. Right there in the friend's house. So the friend wrote to the Rebbe about Haitoch and how, how could such a thing happen in my home on such a holy occasion with such a holy event going on how, how could that be? Why, God? Why? And the Rebbe's response, the Rebbe's letter says that I feel your, your pain. It's a very tragic thing. But perhaps, but perhaps we could see it in the light of had she died at home, she would have been alone, and we may not have found her in good time. Had she been home alone or someplace else, it wouldn't have been in the midst of a joyous occasion when she was celebrating with friends and community. And, and at the time of, of, of completing a Holy Torah scroll, what a time to, to go. So we make the choice then, do we focus on the tragic part of it or do we find the potential beauty and, and goodness in, in, the, in the, the terrible event itself? And that's a choice. It's a choice that we that we make, a conscientious choice of how we have to focus. So we want we want to focus on choosing the positive, choosing to have a, a positivity bias choosing to look at the good things, try, choosing to internalize these ideas so that we push away negative thoughts or unproductive thoughts, push them away, push them away with both hands, not to entertain them, not even to look at them, but to readdress ourselves to something else, engage ourselves in something else so that we can take ourselves away. In fact, one of the things that's been suggested is to, to memorize uh, Psalms or a piece of Torah or a piece of Mishnah to memorize something holy so that when our mind starts to go someplace we don't want it to go we can almost flip a switch and start saying Tehillim start saying Psalms start saying you know the a, a chapter of Tanya right but some Torah th thoughts that will take us a few moments to say and complete, by which time that moment will have passed. All right, but it's going to come again, right? Right? Well, I remember a teacher who said, can you, can you think about something else for 30 seconds? 30 seconds? 30 seconds, I could distract my mind to something else. Okay. Then could you do it again? Could you distract yourself again? 30 seconds at a time. 30 seconds at a time until you've lost track. You know, in, in um, AA, in the 12 steps, sometimes we talk about one day at a time. And sometimes we talk about one hour at a time. Break it up into increments that you can manage. If you know you can only manage a minute, okay, 
So for one minute, redirect by choice to positive thinking and choose to be besimcha. And if we do this again and again, then once we're not controlled by the depressing thoughts or the negative thoughts, then we can choose more readily to focus on all positive and holy ideas. Feedback, what do you think? Chapter seven. Easier said than done. Exactly. Yeah. But um, what do they say? Nothing worth doing is easy? Nothing, nothing no. really worth doing? The easy way out is to, is to allow our, our emotions to control us. That's the easy way out. Not the most productive. Certainly easy way. The hard part is to find the balance. Yeah. Because at a certain, you say you want to block your emotions, you know, uh, so that they, it, they don't control you and everything. Right. But if you go to the extreme of blocking any everything, and not having any feeling, then you cannot there. you cannot use the emotion of making change for good because it's it doesn't exist anymore. Right. Right. It has to be a conscientious activity. I think it's anger has a very bad reputation that it doesn't deserve because here's an emotion that if channeled in the right direction can be extremely positive. Yes. But, but it's sort of like a claim all mine. You have to point it in the right direction. How yes. many heroes were not angry at one point? Exactly. They're becoming a hero. Yeah. And that's the point, is if it's something is angry enough, you're actually going to do something about it. Right. So that's when it becomes a positive, right? You know, it's interesting. In the, in the laws of Shabbos, so if it, can I can I break things on Shabbos? So breaking is destructive, and so generally speaking, just just to be destructive, no, you can't. It's not it's not allowed on Shabbos. It's not allowed to be just destructive, right? On the other hand, how many times are we destructive in order to be productive? Right. So how many times? Do we tear down a building so we can build up a new one? Not on Shabbos. Not on Shabbos, right? <laughs> so it's interesting because if one is, is destructive and shattering the dishes in anger, just throwing dishes and shattering dishes in anger, so is that destructive is or is that productive? If somebody on Shabbos interrupts Depends. interrupts the uh the 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 Seder, the the and but he interrupts it because he realized something's wrong and he wants to get everyone into a safe place, then his destructive interruption, <laughs> which normally would not be allowed. Is for a positive reason. So, so too, smashing dishes in anger you sways the anger. In other words, yeah. when someone is angry and they start breaking things, so the Torah says, hang on a second, that's mm -hmm. not just destructive, that's actually productive because it's it's soothing the anger as well. So it can actually be considered a productive activity. Also, of course, it also depends who the dishes are in there. <laughs> Hopefully you got enough supply of dishes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and anger is is contagious. <laughs> I heard I, I I heard a joke the other day about the guy who said that his he it's finally reached the stage in his marriage where his wife opened the car door for him. <laughs> while they were at 70 miles an hour <laughs> <laughs> but she did but she did open the door 